Uh, so, uh, Peter uh, Segetti, thank you so much for coming out and visiting the International Comparative Law Center. This is a, um, a new format that we're trying out, which is almost like a, uh, um, a awkward uh, interview, right? But uh, really excited to talk to you about um, your recent SJD thesis that you completed. And uh, I was looking at the title and, and reading it this week, and just to jump right into it, uh, the title was Text and Territory, colon, Jurisdictional Conflict and Territorial Language and Law. So I was just wondering, on the one side there's this idea of territory, jurisdiction, things like that, and on the other side there's this idea of um, territoriality, text, language. Can you discuss this distinction, if there is a distinction, between territory and territoriality? So thank you very much, John, for inviting me here, and a big thank you to Mississippi College School of Law for, for having me here. Uh, I'm honored and very pleased to be here and talk about my SJD. Um, so to, to jump right in and address your question, um, I would say that, um, that territory is, is used in, in a myriad different ways in international law, in political theory, in constitutional theory, in statehood, and uh, some of it is geographic, some of it you can actually go out on the ground and measure it of who's, who's, who has a, a right to do or go somewhere and, and uh, who has no rights to be in that place. And some of it is completely abstract without any geographical um, relevance. Uh, and yet, even when, when we have these abstract uh, rights, like rights of free speech, um, intellectual property rights, rights that are completely immaterial, we still speak about them uh, using the same geographical language that uh, was originally developed and used uh, for for property rights and for uh, states' territorial rights. So in, in that sense, there's a, a very strong distinction between uh, territory and territoriality. Territoriality, um, to exaggerate just a little bit, territoriality works quite well without any actual territory. So this is the, the overall thesis of my SJD. So just to follow up on that, so it, it works really well without any actual sort of physical demarcation, so it's like some sort of, I don't know if this is correct, uh, like you would possibly say it's a, it's an organizational principle for a legal mode of thought, or I don't know if it regulates behavior, or, or um, so correct me if I'm wrong on that, but to the extent that it's not a geographical um, sort of presence or place, and that it's more of a, uh, I think in your, in your thesis I read it as a symbolic cipher that organizes the logic of law, something to that effect. To the extent that we're moving in that direction, uh, if, it's, if it's not so natural, if it's something that was created as a, as a way of, of people thinking about logic or a system, when did this uh, sort of idea of territoriality even emerge? So to, to make things a bit more clear, I, I can see some raised eyebrows and uh, <laughs> um, uh, to, to elaborate on this cipher symbolic nature of, uh, of, of territory, let me mention the case of Esther Kaplan, um, which was a US Supreme Court case, uh, Kaplan v. Todd, 1925. Um, where Esther Kaplan was a 13-year-old uh, Jewish immigrant girl who, uh, who was mentally disabled, and US immigration law at the time did not allow for the immigration of, of mentally disabled people. Uh, yet, because this, the, the facts of the case took place in 1914, um, 1914, 1915, um, 
when uh, World War I was just starting up in Europe and there was no, no way to send her back to Europe. Um, the, the New York um, immigration regulators at the time allowed her to be paroled into the US uh, to, to land on US soil but not officially be present in the US. And so she, she spent all of World War I um, living in New York, physically, but uh, without any, any legal right to be there, just uh, through the benevolence of, of the immigration regulators staying there. And then as soon as World War I was over, she was kicked out and deported back to Russia, and this decision was then appealed and made its way to the Supreme and the Supreme Court then decided that all of this was perfectly legal, she had no rights to stay here to begin with, and therefore there is no problem in, in deporting her after having stayed in the U.S. physically for five years. So then the U.S. Supreme Court and U.S. immigration law in general has to make this distinction between physical presence on U.S. soil, which is one thing, which in many cases is, is all important, whether no, in, in order to, to get U.S. citizenship by birth, you have to be physically present on U.S. soil in order to have uh, Fourth Amendment rights, in order to have, um, well, First Amendment rights are more complicated, but a lot of rights are tied to the U.S. soil. But then a lot of rights are not. For example, these immigration rights, um, um, it turns out that there is some sort of special symbolic way of being on U.S. soil just mere presence it isn't enough, there has to be legal presence. Um, and in other cases, for example, with diplomatic uh, immunity, legal presence is attached to the person um, or, or the, the diplomatic property in question, and US soil is quasi-present elsewhere. So there is the symbolic way in which territory is added that, uh, or subtracted from, from actual territory. This is what I mean by this this double discursive and geographic nature of, of to, territory. So, to the extent it's um, symbolic or discursive, what, is there a, a period of time when that started, uh, like being more evident in in the literature, or has that always been the case? The same way that geographical placing has always been the case. So, I found a, a very interesting phenomenon. That, um, that this is not, not just a random way of, of, um, of using um, um, discursive territory, territoriality um, um, as a tool on and on in certain times, certain places, but it actually amounts to an ideology, um, an ethics of territoriality that, uh, that is given um, that is best expressed or, or given a, a range of expression in the mid-19th century and becomes kind of the heart of, of, of liberal political philosophy. And this heart can be condensed into the formula that um, equal rights to all within limits, that everyone has rights and these rights are equal and that these rights exist within certain limits or boundaries um, and then you have this geographical image of everyone exact, uh, existing within their rights within these quasi-geographical but actually imaginary boundaries uh, organized on the analogy of property and you are free within the, that little fenced-in imaginary area but as soon as you go over you're acting illegally, you're infringing on someone else's freedom who also has their own little fenced-in area. And this is, uh, this is intensely historical, so it is presented from, let's say, beginning with Kant up to, up to our days, um, um, very, very present in Isaiah Berlin's work, uh, very present in, uh, in Epstein, the current day libertarian authors, um, it is presented as, as almost a universal law that this is the, the ethical law of freedom. Freedom can only exist within boundaries um, and these boundaries have to be set in some way and if 
these boundaries do not exist, then you either have autocracy or anarchy, but no system of organized freedom. So what was it about, if this came up potentially in the 19th century, I don't know, I don't want to put you, on this, uh, like put you in a position where it's an unanswerable question, and maybe it is, but why or how did it come up then, or what were the conditions that allowed that to happen then, as opposed to um, like 100 years before, 200 years before, does that Yes, Make thank sense. you for the question. Okay. So, um, so this is the topic of my, my first chapter. Um, so you would think, starting out, that because it's presented by all these authors as a universal law, that it's just a product of logic, but at the same time you just don't find this formulation any time before Kant. Nobody speaks about the boundaries of freedom, um, and so many people do after that. Very strange. Um, so I, I tried to trace uh, how and why this, um, this image of, of freedom within boundaries uh, arose and what made it possible. And um, I would say, I, I have found that, that there are four, possibly five routes to that, that made, made this sort of discourse possible. And route number one is the equality of all people, which, which of course has been contested in its own ways, uh, whether that really includes all people, or only white males, or only males, or etc. Th this is a topic that's a bit too large for, for my dissertation. But within a certain class, all people are equal. Um, number two is, uh, is Roman property law which is the first property law that, um, that allows for the abuse of property or the misuse of property, that if an owner kills his slaves, burns his house down, then that is purely his business and he is free to do whatever he wants with his property. So this sort of pro linkage of property and freedom, including the freedom to be wrong, the freedom to be stupid, the freedom to be evil, is a Roman invention. Uh, number three is a late medieval, early modern addition to this, um, that political discourse of what we would now call international law or constitutional law uh, began using um, property terms in increasing frequency. Um, you would have uh, discussions of, of, um, of the freedom of a city-state for example, or a country as its property, which the owners can give away to a ruler or a dynasty, and once they give it away, they no longer have it. You could say that Florence, let's say, once upon a time was an independent republic, but then it came under the rulership of a certain house. Um, the noble then gave, gave, let's say, the, the Spanish king or the French king the, the keys to the city, and from that moment on, it's, it's the possession of the French king, and then this gets extended to, to personal freedom as well. Um, and not just by one school of, of thought, like the Salamanca school is very open about this, but then so is Grotius, um, that um, uh, if you are truly a free individual, then you can sell away your freedom, you can sell uh, your freedom and become a slave. If you can't do that, then you're not really free, um, you're not totally free. So this is route number three. To a certain extent, this gets shut down by, by the notion of inalienable rights and, uh, and this anti uh, enlightenment emphasis on everyone having natural and inalienable rights, for example. Um, but then it does live on in, in certain other aspects like intellectual property which, which is not an emanation of your soul and an inalienable part of you even though you created it, but you can sign these away and sell them, for example. Um, route number four, if I'm there, right? Um, so route number four is, um, is the modern notion that, uh, that freedom has an aspect of, of uh, of moral relativism, 
to it um, that uh, if you're free, kind of a resurrection of, of this, uh, this Roman idea that property has a, uh, includes the right to do wrong, but extend it to other rights as well, that uh, if you're free, you're free to do stupid things as well, you're free to vote for the communists or the Nazis, you're free to uh, express abhorrent ideas, um, and no one can shut you down. And this is the right thing, even though the contents of that right are, are horrible. Uh, the right thing is nevertheless to protect everybody's right to do horrible things in a certain way. Um, and this, this is uh, first expressed, I think, by, uh, um, by John Stuart Mill, um, who, who argues that basically the individual has to have all these rights in order not to be stifled in his creativity by society. So, so if you had these four different um, lineages, for lack of, I'm just not thinking of another word, um, what was it that brought them, to the extent that we can talk about it, what, what were the sort of factors that brought them all together at that moment in the 19th century? Again, as, so I see that there's these different uh, sort of ways people were starting to think about uh, property or territoriality in relation to politics or you know, law and analogizing. But if, if it comes together in the 19th century in this liberal uh, mode of argumentation, legal argumentation, what were the sort of factors that uh, brought it together then as opposed to another time? So um, it's actually anyone's guess to a certain extent mm -hmm. why exactly at that time. Um, there are definitely moments some of them are, are personal decisions, some of them are, are great historical transformations mm. that, that allowed these four moments to come together. Like one great historical transformation is the waning of, of Catholic influence mm. in, in Europe. Um, like for example, root number four, this moral relativism, like Catholic thought, uh, especially medieval Catholic thought would have none of that, of course. That, uh, you did not have uh, any domain of your life where, where uh, you would you would have a right to do wrong, um, and and medieval Catholic writers would fret over such things as uh, um, as what you ate or what you wore. Um, uh, that too had a moral statement included in it. Uh, how much you spoke, like no idle words, for example. That's. Bible, you should not dress ostentatiously, etc., etc. So everything has a, a moral value. Therefore, this sort of freedom, which we today think of as, as the freedom of, uh, of privacy, just did not exist or should not exist. And of course, this, this was um, the moment that, um, that Christianity became fragmented and you have lots of ways of interpreting Christianity, um, this became much more questionable and um, by Locke, by John, in John Locke's letter on toleration, um, he, he's openly skeptical about, uh, about what the true way is and argues that you, you just cannot know which church you should join or what exactly you should do to get to heaven. So therefore, we all need some freedom, um, because nobody should bear the burden of deciding for others what they should do to to achieve um, um, achieve salvation. But then there are some some other very personal moments. Um, for example, um, um, one early precursor to um, to to this sort of Freedom within boundaries is uh, is, um, um, is is Hobbes, is Thomas Hobbes, who who first comes up with the um, with the idea of negative liberty. So this story has been uh, set out quite clearly and several times by by Quentin Skinner and by Philip Petit that um, 
Hobbes was the first person to reduce freedom to non-interference and to argue that uh, if you are not physically prevented from doing something, then you are free, as opposed uh, to the much more ancient notion that you are free if you are free to get involved in government, the sort of positive participatory freedom which the Greeks and the medieval and Renaissance city-states used as a definition of freedom. So Hobbes uses this idea as a sort of slightly disingenuous way of arguing that that you are free even under an absolute monarchy because you are free to come and go, therefore nobody's restricting you, you are just as free as under a republic. And uh, nobody believes him at the time, but 150 years later, um, Jeremy Bentham kind of resurrects this idea and calls it negative freedom and um, basically claims that any other definition of freedom is just metaphysics and, and imprecise and useless and, and this sort of negative freedom of non-interference shall be how, how we define freedom. And then s I, we, we don't quite know why he decided that way, but since then all liberals, most famously Isaiah Berlin, have taken on and championed this view of, of negative liberty. So if, if there is this uh, liberalism that, uh, that emerges in the 19th century that uh, finds a way of deploying uh, territoriality, it, it nevertheless seems to come out of multiple um, trajectories about what territoriality is, and it seems to be moving in, you have options about how you want to use territoriality. So post 19th century into today, it seems to me that you've introduced different ideas about how territoriality could be used, and what that and you know there's options available. If territoriality is a political project, it's not one political project. It offers a lot of different varieties or different metaphors of how it could be used. I, I don't know what the right way of talking about it is. So, um, is there a way that we should understand liberalism and territoriality, or are there different ways we could understand territoriality operating today in liberalism? What would be a useful, or is there a useful mapping of territoriality in the liberal tradition post 19th century? So um, perhaps the, the best way of, um, of seeing territoriality today is, is as a sort of overgrowth, uh, in a way. Let, let, me, let me say that more clearly. Um, so the night, this privileged moment of the 19th century where, when all these roots come together um, and come up with this image of, um, of neat little boundaries and squares. Um, so it's especially interesting, I think, to many uh, many lawyers, and, and you can still see uh, a lot of um, lot of textbooks laying out this sort of ideal image of the law, um, because it's kind of fractal-like. You can fit everything into these sets of, of little squares, of little fields. Uh, this works for, for property law, of course. It works for individual rights. It works also on the level of municipalities or nation states, which can all we can we can all imagine that uh, that perfect harmony would be if everyone acted within their little square and, and nobody went over that. Um, but then, um, in the late nineteenth century to today, um, we we are constantly being reminded that. Uh, that this doesn't quite work, this image, that somebody will overstep their boundaries or there will always be some sort of dispute about where those boundaries are um, and different purposes have different boundaries. Um, for example, in, in Coase's famous uh, ar ar argument or famous example about the, um, about the confectioner and the dentist living next to each other and whenever the, the confectioner uses his machinery, it disturbs the dentist, but then if the dentist requires quiet peace and quiet to do his work, then that's disturbing the confectioner, um, and he can't do his work. And there you actually have kind of two boundaries. Like there is this sort of sound boundary of how, how far do sound waves um, 
extend geographically and they uh, penetrate the dentist's office and cause harm there. And then there's the, the more usual um, understanding of territory as uh, or, or boundaries as, as physical barriers. So, uh, of course, the, the, the dentist and the confectioner cannot physically enter each other's space. So, so there you have this heaping or piling of boundary imagery upon one another. It almost makes me think of how everything today has gone from state-centric models to uh, transnational legal theory, constitutional pluralism, you, know, you, you name it, a dense overlapping institutional frameworks, and, and what's, I th that's fair, right? Like, it almost sounds like an intervention into that. And what's weird to me uh, is that when you were framing that, I got the image of uh, like some sort of emplotment of grids. So it's like these little squares with people, and then there's squares on top of squares. Fair? And I think so. Yes. Okay, so it, so there's there's grids or squared and plot. I don't I don't. I, I call them grids in. in Comfort. Research. Okay. So there's a, so is that so would it be the main way we should. So either, is this the main way we should look at things? Is this the, the, the main trope of territoriality today is through grids? And if so, could you talk to us a little bit about the plus and minuses of grids? Or are there alternative territorial, territoriality models that we could use other than grids? You know, do we have options and what are the pluses and minuses of those? Make sense? Like, so what is the heuristic model that we should use or could use and what are the dangers and benefits of it? Um, so definitely uh, grids, I think, are, are very widespread and perhaps even dominant. Um, but then there are some other ways of, of imagining um, conflicting rights or social organization. Um, one very widespread way is, uh, is the pyramid or a sort of top-down Evolving structure, a sort of triangle, triad, etc., um, where you have the sovereign or the head of authority at the top, and then lesser authority underneath, and then uh, even more devolved, even less authority underneath that. Um, and that that image can bring a certain type of order to to the grid, which which the grid imagery lacks, like some some. Um, some shortcomings of the grid imagery are that um, it can't really handle multiple identities or multiple memberships of a single person. So if you are, um, you, know, you can have your, your own little grid, um, let's say you're, you're a, free, uh, a person, um, a subject of human rights, and therefore all these rights are your little territory, but then, in some other ways, um, as as the member, as an employee, or or a shareholder in a corporation, uh, your voice might not matter, or your employer or the CEO might have rights that directly overrule your input or your interests. And there, if that were to be um, illustrated in a grid pattern, then of course you would be erased, and only the CEO or the employer would have his own little square and he would be inside that square. But then how do you reconcile the two? How do you fit them onto one image? And the answer is you can't really. That's why we have all these overlapping grids to, to illustrate different aspects of how rights conflict. Uh, whereas if you put a pyramid on top of the grid, then you can kind of illustrate of that there's some someone or something that whom who for certain pur purposes can overrule um, your decision. Um, so, so pyramids, well, mostly linked to, to Hans Kelsen, but actually this sort of top-down imagery goes back to, to Hobbes and, and the image of Leviathan, or to even before that, to, um, um, to the, the medieval um, organic um, view of the state of having a head and arms who are the noblemen and feet who are the peasants, etc., etc. So it also has this, um, this big ge genealogy behind it. So the pyramid could fall, 
But, okay, so it, the grid, I get this hope field gone mad, you know, just grids upon grids and boxes and grids going in all different directions. So the pyramid comes uh, as an ordering mechanism, but then the pyramid uh, could fall into similar sort of problems, right? Yeah, exactly. So what do you do with, so, so how? This is, this is something that, uh, that's very prevalent in, in current day legal theory of, uh, of how to reconcile or what to do with the, with the sort of dissolution of, of the pyramid. Um, the, the pyramid presumes a sovereign, some, someone or something on top. Whereas in, in modern constitutional theory, you don't really have a sovereign. Sovereignty is divided between separation of powers. Um, in some cases, the legislature is supreme. In other cases, the Supreme Court. In other cases, you have the, it just becomes a circle. Everything is directed back to the people or the, the voters. Um, so the pyramid becomes a circle. Um, also happens between different legal orders. Um, very, very, um, uh, an immediate problem pl problem in in European law of uh, how to reconcile European law with different national orders, which all have their own constitutions. Who and what is supreme in which case? Um, the the big debate between the the European Court of Justice and the German Constitutional Court, each claiming to be supreme, but allowing the other. To, to kind of carry on its jurisprudence as long as they behave correctly. So there again, you have this sort of cycling of, of one legal system turning into another, and you can't quite see the boundaries. So the, the grid becomes the pyramid, which becomes the grid, and there's a, a, a power base, and there's an outside, and then... And then, yes, it just dissolves into one another. You can't quite create a, a map system uh -huh. especially especially true if you bring in um, hearts core penumbra distinction and all the debates that we've been having about interpretation of concepts and uh, how concepts can be defined in different ways since the 1960s um, and their heart basically claims that in many cases you just don't have a boundary that the grid kind of dissolves. You have a core that you can sense is the core, and you have a penumbra, but there is no distinction really between the core and the penumbra, uh, otherwise you would have again a boundary. Um, you just kind of sense denser and less dense areas. So all these three, I call them schemas, um, the, the grid, the core, and, uh, the grid, the core periphery, and the pyramid are used interchangeably in in a lot of legal texts. Just usually, just a hint of it, saying that something is hierarchically ordered or something is vertical, and then stating, let's say, the opposite that it's a horizontal ordering or the relationship between two parties is horizontal, for example. Well, all of these are shorthand for the pyramid or the grid. So territoriality in these different uh, like uh, schema, uh, do a do a lot of work for giving us a sense of identity or legal rationality, or the sense that we're working towards solutions that can be predictable or make sense or something like that. Yes. So you're yes. are you, is, so is this project a, like a, a denaturalization of of our idea of territoriality? Like to say, hey, look, it's it's here everywhere and and you haven't been looking at it, but look at what it's doing, or so. Um, I get so. Where are we? So where is the? Where are we at? And where would we go with this once we understand that territoriality is doing these strange things that we oftentimes don't appreciate? Uh, what might be directions of where we can go, or what have you done with it to date? And where would you think it would be interesting to push it in a direction? I don't know if denaturalize is the right. Uh, like more accurate word, but um, so I'm going to go with denaturalization to to point out that in all these schemas, all these dense legal theoretical debates about what uh, a legal system looks like, we haven't spoken anything at all about actual territory. Hmm. 
uh, it can take place anywhere, any legal system, any normative system. We can organize it into grids or pyramids as we want. Um, territory has disappeared. And this is, uh, this is also true in a, in a more specific sense when, when you look at uh, actual legal systems. Um, you know, there is this assumption of territoriality that uh, wh wherever a, a, a legal system is somewhere, that the Constitution is valid over a certain area. But it's never in the Constitution which areas. Like You can take away half the territory of, of the United States, and the Constitution would not become invalid. It would still be the same constitutional order, um, or you, know, the con you can expand it again, same thing during the 19th century. Um, you, you, didn't, you never really had to put in a, an amendment to the Constitution because the US got bigger or smaller in some way. So, so completely unconnected to, to geographic territory. And um, this might be, I think, my takeaway. And I think this, this opens up another vista or possibility of research of looking at how can we and when should we connect or reconnect territoriality um, with, with geographic territory. Uh, are there, is there a possibility and is there any political wisdom in, in, uh, in trying to, to literally ground law in, in the geographic characteristics of a certain territory? Um, and this will probably be my, my next project to, to see if we can um, push an ecological concept of law which would take the the actual geophysical, geobiophysical characteristics of a certain territory, the fact that in some places it's hot and dry, in other places it's humid, some places have forests, other places have um, ocean currents, etc. Could that, could that be the starting block for, uh, for legal regulation? And there are hints in, in certain aspects of the law, law of the sea where, where this is taken as a starting point. Um, for example, the, the migration patterns of certain fish, um, especially salmon and other fish that, that spawn in rivers, therefore outside of the sea, but live their lives in the sea. Um, like they belong to the country where they spawn, independent of where they actually are. You cannot legally harvest salmon in the ocean or only with the permission of the country where they spawn, for example. Could that be extended to prevailing wind patterns, which would then have their own jurisdictional area or commissions that, that um, watch over certain ocean currents and, and all the, the fish species and, um, and plankton and marine life that, that are dependent on that ocean current? That just, this sounds like such a fantastic project. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, sharing this time together and sharing uh, what you're working on and, and uh, possible directions of where this is going to go. I can't wait to read this. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very much. much.